Okay, so we are um, diving into uh, day two here, and we've got two more PowerPoints to get through today. Uh, we'll be going over sports performance testing and flexibility training. Um, so these are both topics that, since we didn't get any new folks, uh, these are both topics that uh, we've really been over. I mean, obviously the sports performance testing is the PES version of assessments. Um, by the way, uh, the email I just sent you with the uh, copy of the textbook, you're gonna notice it's a different cover. Um, that's just because they updated it. Uh, recently, all the photos are like new inside the textbook. It's technically the second edition, whereas these pictures are from the first edition, uh, but it's page for page the same. Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll be going over our sports performance testing right now, which is going to be assessments again. And then we'll tie that to our flexibility training where we'll look at like, you know, what you do if you test and find somebody has, you know, knees caving in or whatever. Um, so it's nice, this is gonna be a good review day uh, of similarly to how we did PFT 101 in our assessments class. So today our goals are to um, explain the components of good sports performance testing and understand the difference between our subjective and objective information, which is the, the last time for a while that I, I will be hammering that concept in. I know that sometimes people get a little tired, like we get it. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> the last day we go over that. Bless you, whoever that was. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's me. I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> no problem. I've never had uh, that trouble before. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll be looking at uh, understanding like our our um, the goals and needs of our athletes, right? Uh, and that's always important depending on what sport it is you're playing. You know, like your goals are going to be different. Uh, like I always thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, but did you guys know, like in the NFL Combine, you have to be able to uh, bench press? I think it's I think it's two twenty five minimum, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's it. Is that the number? Mm -hmm. And it's it's and that's just like a rule to be in the NFL, which is ironic because I'm like a kicker doesn't need bench pressing and nor does like a even a quarterback like a quarterback needs upper body strength but like it's always kind of funny but it's like that's kind of a flat rule um but then there's very less stringent like because everybody in the combine kind of goes through the same things and it's always kind of funny to me when um they don't even show it anymore like i mean sometimes like sometimes they still do but they'll do like uh they'll do like agility drills in like the nfl combine and it's like they'll show like running backs and wide receivers and tight ends. And then like a quarterback will go out there and it's like, let's go ahead and take a look at the other part of the combine that's going on over here. <laughs> and, like, they move away and it's like, yeah, we all get it. Like that's not really their thing. Um, except for Russell Wilson, who is the greatest scrambler of all time. Uh, I don't want to hear any guff about uh, the Ravens right now. <laughs> My roommate and I have a huge Ravens uh, Seahawks rivalry that, you know, obviously doesn't actually exist, but like we made one up. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, we need to kind of understand like through testing, like what's important for, uh, you know, your specific athletes, like needs and goals, right? Um, you know, uh, what is important to them? Uh, we don't use performance testing or, or, you know, fitness assessments to diagnose any conditions, just like before, right? We know that that's true. Um, we, uh, but really, we're just trying to get information about somebody's past, present, future. And then we do all of that in order to kind of come up with an individualized program for our athlete. Like, for instance, let's say uh, it's the beginning of a season and you are you know, coaching a, a soccer team of some type, right? Like maybe you're doing an after school program uh, and you're playing soccer with your kids. Uh, you're like the, you're going to be like coaching that. In the beginning of the season, you're probably going to run them through some drills and some activities related to the sport, uh, like some agility drills or dribbling drills or something like that. And you're going to see like which kids are, you know, knocking it out and 10 seconds versus the ones who are really kind of struggling. Like if you were to put me on a, through a, like a soccer agility course and I have to like run it, uh, it's going to go fairly well. But then if you make me run it again, where I have to dribble a soccer drill while going through some type of agility course, 
I mean, I can't do that at all. <laughs> like, I, don't, I kick it way too hard. It goes flying, right? Um, and so, like, uh, or I totally miss it and it goes in the wrong direction. Either way, I'm going to be very slow going through, like, a soccer dribbling-based drill. So once you find that information, like if you were my coach, you'd be like, okay, so we're going to be focusing on, on dribbling today. You know, like you're going to know specifically like what type of things you need to work on to sort of enhance your athlete. Uh, let's say you're training somebody who's doing like a 400 meter dash, you know, um, you're going to look to see like what parts of the race they are sort of like lagging in and be like, all right, we're going to work on this part. Like me. Um, the one thing that I was always actually pretty good at when it came to like my 5k, like I was a, a cross country runner. Um, I had a really strong kick, which is kind of a good thing because it's like, it meant that I was really good at like leaving nothing on the table. Your kick is the last, like, um, the last little bit of a race where you just basically give it your all. And it's like, you're not leaving anything left in the tank. You know, 5k is like a couple miles. So you want to make sure that like, you're not burning energy too quickly. Um, but once the race is over, like you just want to burn all that off and make sure you didn't leave anything behind. I always had a really strong kick, which I thought was really good. Um, and I thought that was like a good quality to have, but, uh, my coach was like the problem, like the reason you have such a strong kick is because you are conserving too much energy throughout the rest of your race. Uh, and so like, that was something I needed to work. I needed to work on like doing like a lot of pacing drills. Um, and that always like helped me. Uh, if you're playing something like baseball, uh, and you're looking at, uh, learning how to like, you know, run the bases or, you know, uh, run down like a pop fly or something like that, uh, and you're having trouble with like your reaction time, well then like quickness drills might be the best thing for you, right? Uh, learning how to like read what direction something is going on. Uh, you know, in order to determine, like, are you going to, like, move in one direction or another, and then, like, you can, you know, get up to speed as fast as possible. That's, like, a quickness thing, right? Like, learning how to react in real time. Um, so, you know, thanks to all the different types of drills that we have, we're going to be able to do that. So, um, in order to go ahead and start our assessments, just like uh, we would with anybody, no matter if we're, we're training an athlete or if we're training, like, an average everyday client, uh, we first got to gather the right types of information about our client's background, right? Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with our subjective information. Right, info that cannot be measured, right? Uh, and this will help us determine the readiness for activity and a general background on our client's um, history. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we're going to use the par queue for this, right? We still are going to use this uh, with even our sports athletes. I know it's like sometimes people are like, well, aren't they athletic? I mean, what are the odds of them having uh, cardiovascular issues? And it's like, well, the odds are low, but the whole point of the par queue is to make sure that we don't get the pants suit off of us. So like, uh, whether the risk is low or not, we definitely want to ask this before we get started. So again, it's going to be questions like, has your doctor ever said that you have uh, a cardiovascular condition? Um, uh, you know, is there ever a time where like your doctor, you know, physical activity was not recommended by your doctor? Um, by the way, when you look at like certain uh, physical like testing protocols, uh, you know, each, each, like area of um athletics is going to have specific like rules and regulations uh and i'm sure they test for it in the nfl as well uh but i know in particular uh, there's a kind of an interesting story have you guys ever heard of marfan's syndrome um it is an interesting connective tissue disorder uh, it's a genetic disorder that people are born with sometimes it's very noticeable but sometimes it's not uh and if you take a look, what it'll actually kind of look like, here's like an example that's like obviously extremely, extremely uh, easy to kind of spot, but it's actually where connective tissue um, is a little weak in some ways. And what you'll often see are kind of these like big gangly looking like joints and stuff. And so like the bones will actually grow really long and you can see like 
look at how long this person's like thumb is uh, and like these big long fingers. That's actually kind of a symptom of Marfan's syndrome. And it's like how some folks are born. Some people just go their whole lives without really like realizing that this is something they deal with. Um, and you know, they actually are very, very athletic. The NBA tests for this in particular uh, because obviously very long, like very tall individuals, right? Uh, and so when we're looking at like a super like tall person, there is an op there is a, a chance that like the reason they grew so long is because like they have Marfan syndrome. Uh, and a few years ago, there was a really interesting story where a kid had gone all the way through uh, college, never found out that he had it. And sure enough, like when they tested him for it in the NBA, he had it and they couldn't let him play in the NBA. Uh, and the reason they can't do that is because this connective tissue, it doesn't just affect like your bones and joints. It also it affects like how your heart is held in place. Um, so if you get jostled really hard, you could literally like your heart could fall into your stomach, you know? Um, and so like, it's a really like dangerous condition if you're playing like pro, uh, you know, pro sports. So I can't let anybody in who had that. And uh, I'm trying to remember like what happened to this kid. Do you remember hearing this story, Meg? Brad, they do that for boxing too because of the arm reach, the reach. So they test their uh, arm length. And if you know they're longer than their body, then they have to go get tested for this syndrome, and they can't fight. Oh, sure enough, oh, that makes sense. I would I, that definitely makes sense in uh, um, just somebody who's actually playing uh, in like a boxing sport as well. Oh, okay, for a second I thought this kid made it into the NBA. I was like, I was like, well, that's the exact opposite of why I was looking this up. That's nuts. Um, uh, yeah, so he was in, it was the 2014 NBA draft, um, and it was really cool, like, they, uh, um, he got, like, a ceremonial pick uh, in the NBA, they, like, I, this is the reason I, like, remember the story, is because, like, he got to go to the NBA draft, and they, they still, like, honorarily, like, drafted him into the, and I was like, oh, that's so cool, and I'm, like, I remember just being, like, a little emotional, like, I was like, oh, man, like, didn't get to play but at least the nba is like recognizing that he was like an awesome center like <laughs> um but that's kind of an interesting like thing that's part and that's that's not obviously on the park you right it's like do you have morphin syndrome uh but remember like no matter if it's an athlete or what this is why we're testing for stuff like this right it's in order to keep ourselves safe um and the client and the client which is arguably more important uh so physical activity readiness questionnaire um, this is going to uh, determine if the client is ready to engage in uh, physical activity. Right. Uh, then also part of our subjective information, we have got our uh, general slash medical history questionnaire. Um, so the general and medical history questionnaire are just going to be questions uh, related to a client's medical history. Um, a client's medical history, background, uh, but also things like their hobbies. Like it's a general questionnaire as well. Um, and hobbies or interests, right? That is important. Um, as well. So when we're looking at that, you know, like this is going to provide information about like past injuries, right? Which is obviously very specific to sports. It happens all the time, right? So it's going to be uh, helpful in gathering information about past injuries or surgeries, right? That's a really big uh, thing that we're looking at as well. And so like, again, if you're trying to like, um, test an athlete who has had like a history they're like it's like let's talk about like any general and medical history problems that you've had have you ever had like ankle problems like yeah i sprained my ankle uh I, you know i've had a history of ankle sprains uh, on my right ankle pretty consistently uh and actually had to have surgery a couple of years ago for it and it's like wow okay so it's like ankle sprains are a very 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 common 
thing, right, for this specific individual. Um, so now we got to kind of make, that, that gives us an idea of like, well, let's take a look at this person's posture and sort of determine like what's going on that might be causing, like what's the root cause here? Like, do they have a habit of standing a specific way, which is creating overactive slash underactive muscles, which is leading to this, um, which is leading to this problem? Like what's, what is you know causing their ankle sprains? Is it that they just have a bum ankle, uh, or is it the fact that like maybe they have uh, severe pronation happening? You know, now we kind of know what to look for. Um, so that's going to be a big one as well. We also know that like glute weakness on that same side is very very common. Uh, and then we've got all of our objective information again, um, all the various types of performance assessments or you know, postural assessments that we're going to look at. So uh, objective information is all of the information that can be measured, right? Um, so, oh, this is weird. The, that's not accurate. This is not objective information. But your medical history, such as like your conditions, is part of this as well. Um, so like uh, comorbidities, uh, health, conditions um, or chronic, yeah, chronic health conditions. Uh, are examples as well. So, um, you know, any condition that somebody has, right? Uh, remember, oh, and the medications. Medications do also fall under uh, the subjective information because yeah like we might be able to measure like how much medicine somebody takes you know like let's say somebody's on uh, a medication to lower their blood pressure right let's say they're on a like a beta blocker uh and you know we know how to measure we can slap a number on like how much of that medication they're taking but we can't really measure objectively we can't really measure how much it's directly affecting them right uh you know I know that like me, I'm super sensitive to certain types of medication. Like I've only had a uh, prescription painkiller one time in my life. Um, and like, I hated it because I could not function at all on it. I mean, like I was on like a pretty low dosage and it knocked me out. Um, and so like certain people are going to be affected by that differently. You know, uh, my mom's the exact opposite. She like, doesn't do anything for her. <laughs> um, so uh, again, objective information, that is gonna be our objective measurable data, right? Um, so there's a big sort of like the three most common that we're gonna primarily talk about for sports specific training are going to be things like our physiologic assessments, our postural assessments, and of course, performance assessments, right? So um, looking at our physiologic assessments, right? Mm -hmm. These are going to be uh, assessments related to overall health information. Good examples are like heart rate, uh, blood pressure. You know, I'm gonna put these all on one line actually. Heart rate, blood pressure. Um, they're putting circumference and BMI on here. Um, that's half accurate. I mean, like your regular book doesn't uh doesn't categorize them that way uh this is why i told you guys like they're never going to ask you like what category your assessments fall under uh because like nasm is super freaking inconsistent about how they like measure these you know like we went over the last time we taught objective information we went over there's physiologic assessments and body composition assessments and uh performance assessments there's like a, all these big extended categories this kind of waters it down to like three big ones. It's like postural, physiological, and performance, because those are kind of related to, you know, sports and athletes in general. Um, but yeah, the categories don't, the end of the day, just don't work on like, don't try to memorize the categories because they're super inconsistent. And that's not something they test you on. They're just here to make the notes a little simpler to understand. Um, so heart rate, blood pressure, uh, circumference, Uh, and BMI, right? Those are all really good examples there. Um, so when we're looking at like body composition, right? 
Uh, I'm not going to go over like eat, uh, put these in your notes individually anymore, but we have like uh, different ways of getting body composition. Um, this could be helpful, you know, like if you're trying to track, uh, you know, trying to think of like a clear example in sports where you would really need to measure somebody's body composition. Um, and the first person who kind of popped into my mind, and I don't know why, uh, is Shaq. Uh, like, Shaq was a tremendous athlete, but, like, he had a really bad habit of, like, falling out of shape in the offseason. <laughs> like, like, he'd be, like, you know, he was incredible. Like, he was, he was one of the greatest, you know? Um, but the offseason, that man was clearly spending a lot of time at Olive Garden, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> endless pasta or whatever. Uh, <laughs> he would come back in, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's a lot of, like, what led to so much tension between him and Kobe is, like, Kobe like would come back in the off season and he'd learn like a, he's like learned some new skill. Uh, Shaq would come back in the off season, <laughs> like, you know, quite a few pounds heavier and you'd watch him like lean out over the course of the season. Um, well, you know, if you're tracking that kind of stuff, because maybe you're the coach, like it's probably important to know a little bit about like those body fat testing. Um, so, uh, body composition assessments that we've got, right? We've got the skin fold thickness version, uh, which is that Dern and Wamersley formula that we've talked about in the past, right? Uh, it's a foresight method, biceps, triceps, subscapular, and iliac crest. Um, then we have sort of the most convenient version, which is bioelectric impedance. Uh, bioelectric impedance is where uh, you are going to hold on to those specific electrodes, uh, and it is going to send a very small electric current throughout your body. Um, it'll basically measure how quickly that current travels from point A to point B. If it travels really quickly, we know uh, that the body fat percentage is low because electricity travels through water very quickly, uh, and muscle has a lot of water in it. Most of your body tissues have a lot of water in it. Um, but if the signal travels really slowly, we know that it is being, the signal is being impeded because there's a lot of other not water-based tissue that it has to travel through, aka body fat, right? Body fat is mostly made up of lipids, so it has a very low water quality. Um, so depending on how fast that signal travels, the body fat tester can estimate your body fat percentage. Uh, and they're pretty good nowadays. Like the, the tech is actually pretty decent. Um, everybody's probably used one of these before. This is kind of interesting. Um, I'm only pulling this up because it's kind of funny. Uh, Omron is a company that makes like a lot of like, you know, health related uh, testing and stuff. Um, but like, let's take a look at uh, Omron body fat analyzer. Take a look at this. Uh, three hundred and seventy five dollars on ebay right now which is crazy uh because these things were literally 25 dollars for like a long time but i think they were discontinued and like i actually had a i had a student just recently who what is this <laughs> 12 that's 30, like a nine. game remote like a it, gamer's this thing, doesn't it, though? Yeah. yeah have you like, ever used one of these? You've never, like, experienced No. Uh -uh. Oh, we have two of them at Sochi. Um, yeah, they're, they're literally $25. Like, they were, they were nothing. Um, I used to have one until it got stolen out of my car. Uh, and I wish I still did, because I'd slap that thing up on eBay, man. <laughs> like, I can get body fat testers elsewhere easily. But look at these. They're yeah. like 100 bucks now. How weird is that? That's crazy. I used to have... I used to have like the one that says three hundred and seventy-five dollars, and I think I bought it for twenty bucks. Yeah, yeah. I think That's they're just so crazy. continued, and now the whole world kind of freaked out. But you know, here's the real reason I bring this up. You know, what's really weird about this. Um, so this is by a company called Omron, right? And they make other stuff too. They make like blood pr pressure testers, and apparently they must also make um, gate, like gates to front doors or front lawns for houses because my like gate I was walking into my new apartment and I looked and there's a sticker and it was Omron and I was like what <laughs> like Omron gate open sensor yeah so I was like I was meant to live in this apartment yep sure enough there it is and it's the same company like that's the same font it must have to do with like just the electronics probably yeah I guess so 
But I was yeah. like, I, you know, I told my roommates, I was like, guys, I was like, this is the same people that make the body fat testers. And they were like, we don't care. And I was like, okay, well, I'll tell my class. They'll find it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we care. We care. Right. Yeah, man. It's cool. I'm a trainer and I moved yeah. into a place that is an Omron gate. Uh, cool. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's that's sort of a very common very convenient version i think the reason it's probably just going out there's probably just more stiff competition out there nowadays uh body fat scales have become so much better in the last few years that i'm sure that's the reason like omron probably discontinued their body fat testers uh the technology's just gotten so good nowadays that like gyms will often have like a small scale and they'll have you step onto it and usually has like a handle thing so you get more points of contact and makes it a little more accurate um nowadays there's so much of that stuff i think they're just being pushed out of business um so i think that's the main reason why we're seeing that um so skin fold thickness pretty accurate fairly convenient uh bioelectric impedance incredibly convenient and fairly accurate although don't forget like remember this is using how quickly electricity travels in order to estimate body fat percentage so you know we used to goof around with the body fat testers all of the time at work uh we used to like test our body fat percentage and then like run to the bathroom and go pee and then like come back and test it again and like watch as your body fat percentage climbed ever so slightly uh and then like we would like drink a bunch of water and then like watch it go down ever so slightly um so you know it's not incredibly accurate all the time but it's not bad uh, and then there's the most accurate but very inconvenient version, which is underwater hydrostatic weighing. Hydrostatic weighing is super accurate because we know exactly how much body fat weighs underwater. Um, so if you weigh 180 pounds and then we put you underwater and you weigh, so let's say we get two people who both weigh 180 pounds. We submerge both of them in water right? Um, they both weigh the same outside, but one person now weighs more underwater and one person weighs less underwater. The person who weighs less underwater is going to have a higher body fat percentage because fat actually floats. Uh, it is less buoyant than regular water. And that's why like oil, you know, sits on top of your pot if you ever put that in with your pasta and stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that is, uh, uh how hydrostatic weighing works uh and then we have and i can never say this word uh whole body plethysmography blah uh <laughs> aka the bod pod uh and basically that's where they put you in this little chair and like it closes and it measures how um how much pressure changes there are uh between like uh you know the air as it's flowing around um it's fairly accurate as well I would say it's in line with bioelectric impedance. I don't think it's as accurate as under as hydrostatic weighing personally. But then again, I don't have a ton of experience working with it. Um, these are the three that I've sort of done consistently throughout like my career. Uh, and these are the two that you'll probably end up doing in most traditional like gym formats. Um, all right, so that is uh, talking about like body composition stuff. Then obviously we have like circumference measurements, right? If we're trying to like measure um, uh, if we're trying to measure, uh, somebody's like, you know, body girth and stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, we do know that the waist to hip ratio is part of that as well. Uh, if your client has like a, a waist to hip ratio outside of normal ranges, we do know that puts them at certain risk for certain, you know, cardiovascular diseases. Um, again, stuff like that's not going to be very common if you're in the sports world, but it is always a good reminder of like what objective information is important for trainers in general. Um, now, one that is very important for our athletes and very important for everybody are our posture assessments. Um, right, and these are assessments designed to look at the structural and functional alignment of a client alignment good lord uh structural and functional alignment of a client's uh body right we are assessing their posture um so there's a couple kind of common versions here we've got static postural assessments which is literally as simple as like observing your client as they stand in 
all three kind of positions, right? Uh, frontal, lateral, and posterior. Uh, then we also have transitional assessments, such as the overhead squat, right? Um, that is a, uh, I'm sorry, transitional assessment, such as like the gait assessment, right? Like while they're walking, um, that's considered transitional because uh, the ground underneath them is basically moving. They're traveling, they're transitioning. Uh, and then we have like our uh, dynamic assessments, which are assessments that occur like during movement uh, of your, like while they're moving their joints. So like the overhead squat, you're moving a lot of joints, therefore it's dynamic. Um, so here's like an example of a static postural assessment. You're literally just going to look at the alignment. Uh, we want the knee to line up directly over the ankle. Uh, that should be directly lined up with the center of the pelvis. Uh, that should travel up and line up uh, with your uh, um, AC joint on the shoulder there, and then that should line up with the ear. So we should have a nice straight line, uh, you know, down the body there, and then everything should sit level, right? Uh, we shouldn't see tilting in the pelvis. We shouldn't see rounding in the shoulders. Um, that's kind of what we're looking for. We shouldn't see locking in the knees. Uh, back view as well, same concept. Did I just skip the anterior view? Is it the last? No, I just skips it. Uh, same thing from the back, right? We're going to look to see, like, is it level? Is it in alignment, right? Um, does your client, like, sit into one side? Like, do they have, like, a scoliosis? Remember, we were talking about those oblique subsystems yesterday. A lot of times when you see somebody shift over to this side down below, they will shift over to this side up above. So if I kick my hip out this way, you can even see, like, I kind of, my body naturally, like, dropped my upper body over this way. Um, as I did that, that's what a scoliosis is, right? Uh, scoliosis will always like um, tend to, if it shifts in one direction, uh, shift further back in the other direction. Kind of like how you stack like a tower of Jenga, you know? <laughs> um, you want to make sure you even the sides out. So um, that's a really big one. And then we have like our transitional assessments here. Uh, transitional assessments are going to be things like, um, uh, giving you a quick impression of like what somebody's gait looks like. Uh, wait, are these, wait, are you, why are you calling this trend? Boy, this is all over the place actually. Uh, let me take back what I said uh, about transitionals. It looks like in this book I've got them backwards. This is why these categories are not uh, consistent. <laughs> uh, this is why these, you're never going to be tested on these categories because it's different in the PES book than it is in the CES book apparently which is irritating. Uh, actually, now that I'm saying all this, I kind of remember this happening the last time I taught this class too. Um, <laughs> so uh, transitional assessments like the overhead squat, uh, which is a dynamic postural assessment. Um, so that's going to identify your overactive and your underactive muscles, right? Uh, you're going to observe specific key kinetic chain checkpoints. You're going to look at the foot and ankle complex, the knee complex, the lumbopelvic hip complex, shoulders, and cervical spine. Um, so uh, overhead squat is obviously sort of our, our classic example of this. Um, there are many postural assessments out there. And there's other postural assessments that NASM doesn't actually cover as well. There's other ways to do the overhead squat. For instance, if you guys get uh, a job at Equinox, if you decide that's where you want to work, um, they'll teach you their version of an overhead squat assessment, which is exactly the same, except that you do it with a broomstick that you're holding overhead. Um, concept's exactly the same. It just, you know, all posture assessments, no matter like which assessment you're doing, the purpose is to tell you what the overactive, underactive muscles are. You know, for instance, when you get to capstone, you're going to learn something like the Eli's test and, and the Thomas test, which are both like assessments where you move your pelvis. And you can kind of see actually, um, here's kind of a simple example. If you watch like me perform hip extension, do you see the ever so slight low back motion that I have? Right? You see how there's just like a little curving there? Um, that's actually my low back trying to do hip extension, uh, you know, and it's likely because like my hamstrings are so overactive that they are inhibiting my glute so that my glute is not performing hip extension as well as it's supposed to, which is why I always stretch the crap out of my hamstrings before I start working out so I can turn them off and allow my glute to do its job. Um, that's a very specific postural assessment that you'll learn later. Um, but like they're all, you know, the purpose is the same, right? It told us our overactive, underactive muscles. Um, so 
Uh, overhead squad is going to be the classic example here. We got to put that up. Um, I, uh, which is going to be a transitional postural assessment designed to um, give insight into uh, overactive slash underactive muscles during a squat motion, right? Um, so we're looking to see like what overactive, underactive muscles somebody has. Uh, the other classic example uh, is still going to be the same one here. The single leg uh, squat assessment. Very similar as well. Um, this is going to be designed, uh, this is going to be a transitional postural assessment designed to give insight into ankle proprioception and core strength, as well as like posture, right? So like when you do the uh, single leg, like let's say they did the overhead squat and it looked really good, right? Boom, it's great. And then all of a sudden they go to do their single leg squat and bam, their knee caves in like crazy. It's like, oh, well they didn't have knee cave in problem when they did the overhead squat, but suddenly when we took like um, their balance away by putting them onto one leg, suddenly things got much, much worse, right? They, they adducted the knee uh, and internally rotated it. So now we know that like, as they rely on balance, uh, it could be related to overactive muscles in the, the thigh and the hip, but it also could just be like a weak foot, a weak core, you know, all those things. So it just kind of gives us insight into that. Uh, and then we got the push-pull assessment here. Uh, which is a transitional uh, upper body postural assessment designed to um, give insight into over active slash underactive and upper body. So again, um, upper body. Although don't forget there is like a little bit of core in there as well. You are looking for excessive arching during those assessments. Um, now looking at some of our PES version dynamic assessments, <laughs> we have also got the less test. We talked about this uh, in our performance class, right? Um, the landing error scoring system or less uh, test. Uh, this is actually um, very specific to athletes, uh, but it is one of my favorite assessments to give me insight about somebody's posture. But again, you are going to have a client uh, stand on a one foot height uh, box. So this is actually a little too tall. Um, also, you're going to have your client do it in shoes rather than barefoot. Um, my whole life is a freaking mess right now. Uh, so you're going to have your client here, and basically what they're going to do is they're going to stand, toes pointing forward, uh, and they're going to jump onto the floor, squat, and then do another jump. So the big thing here is that they're not just like jumping and landing, they're doing what's called a depth jump. And a depth jump is where once you're done like landing, you do a, a squat jump for, for afterwards. So I would go from here, uh, and I would jump down, squat, and leap. Right, and you're going to grade your client um, on a few key areas. So I'm going to pull up a last test scoring sheet. So as you look at it, you are going to give your client, this is like golf, by the way, you want to have as low a score as possible. Um, but you're looking for, was their stance width normal? Uh, I have a, I'm assuming mine was actually a little wide there. Uh, <laughs> that felt like I feel it in my hamstrings a little more. And I know that if I feel it in my hamstrings, uh, it's always because I squatted too wide. Uh, so <laughs> you would observe and see, um, you know, was their squat, uh, with normal or was it wide or was it too narrow? Uh, did they have a foot rotation, right? Did their feet turn out, uh, at any moment during the assessment? Uh, if it excessively externally rotated, we know that pronation is probably occurring. Uh, so that's worth a point, or if it internally rotated, which again is rare, but sometimes happens, uh, that is going to be worth a point uh, because of um, 
uh, inversion and uh, uh, supination. Then we see foot contact. Was it symmetric or did they land, uh, you know, off stance, like one foot forward, one foot backwards? Um, did they have a lot of knee valgus? Did they have very, you know, little knee valgus or none? Uh, ideally, they had none. Hopefully, their knees stayed in alignment. Um, did they have some lateral trunk flexion? Like, were they curving their, like, upper and lower back? Uh, did they land heel to toe or, or toe to heel? Or did they land flat? Ideally, we want them to land toe to heel, right? Their calves should be taking most of the brunt of that impact. Um, knee flexion displacement. So what that one is, is actually, like, remember, knee flexion is this right so did they land and then their knees traveled super far forward was it a very like quad heavy landing or was it a very glute heavy landing um you know how much displacement happened there if it was a lot uh if it was you know um if they were you know sitting back onto their hips really well they're gonna get good points uh if they you know landed kind of averagely just like you know somewhat upright but not flexing the knees very much um that'd be average it's worth one point but then if, or if they landed and it was just like bam <laughs> like uh and they just didn't bend their knees at all it's like Ugh. uh <laughs> that means that their jumping mechanics are not so awesome um that's going to be very little knee displacement so that would be worth two points um total joint displacement in the sagittal plane uh when they say joint displacement they mean just like did they land hard or did they land soft um, it was a soft, nice, quiet landing. Uh, that's pretty good. You know, we want, we're going to give them zero points for that. I'd say, like, my landing was somewhat loud, actually, because um, I was a little nervous about being barefoot. Uh, so I would say, like, average there. Uh, it was a really, really, really stiff. And then there is just, like, the ability to kind of add, like, you know, if there was just instinctively you felt that you need to add an extra point or two uh, on at the end there. And so that is, that's sort of how we perform uh, the less test there. It's a, uh, it is a dynamic assessment designed to uh, test a client's jumping and uh, slash landing capabilities. Uh, it's the lower the score, the better, right? Um, so you're gonna have a client perform like a few versions of that, or you could have them do it like, you know, once or twice, uh, once from a frontal view and one from a lateral view, uh, and use like a high speed camera and then just play that information back. Uh, that's also a really effective way of doing that. And that way they don't have to do like a million repetitions. Um, oops. So that's a really good example of the less test. Uh, and then we have our performance assessments here. Um, which are obviously a big part of like the sports field, right? Performance assessments, um, you know, are really a big focus. This is where we're looking for somebody's stabilization, strength, and power, right? We're looking at like what type of athlete they are good with. We're also going to assess the things like their speed, agility, and quickness, as well as just overall conditioning. So these are three kind of main areas we're seeing here, right? Stability, strength, and power, um, that would be like, uh, I mean, honestly, like the overhead squat is actually a good example of a stability test, but stability would be more like assessing for someone's balance during an activity, right? So for instance, like uh, if you were doing like a Davies test, right? That's an upper body agility assessment because it's very transitional, but you're all, you're testing for shoulder stability, right? Um, then there's things like the one rep max bench assessment, right? Where you're just lifting as heavy as you can or your one rep max squat assessment. That's very much a strength assessment. Then we have power assessments such as like the soccer medicine ball soccer throw assessment, which is as simple as it sounds. You stand on a line, hold a medicine ball in your hand for about 10% of your uh, body weight, and you're going to throw it as far as you can and assess how far it travels. Um, that's actually, uh, do I have any military folks in the call? Um, they're changing the, like the army fitness assessment. Like it used to be, uh, kind of just that classic, what was it? I think it was push-ups, um, sit up, uh, push-ups, sit-ups and like a one mile run. I think is what you said. I could be totally wrong on that. Um, but like it was a really super crazy, simple assessment. Now they've modified it. The new, let's see here. Let's look this up. New 
uh, army fitness test. Um, they, they really, come on, give me a graphic so I don't have to like <laughs> read a whole article. Uh, <laughs> they really redid the whole thing. Um, there we go. Yeah, so it used to be uh, three events. You had to do push-ups, sit-ups, and a two-mile run, not a one-mile run. Um, and so, like, that was it. And you just had to get, like, you know, uh, X number of points. That was all you needed. But now uh, they're going to have people do a – they do the uh, deadlift. They do a medicine – they call it a standing power throw. It's a medicine ball soccer throw, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's a chest pass throw. Uh, hand release push-up uh, assessment, which – a hand release push up is that one. If you guys have ever done this, it's where uh, you do a push up and then when you go down, uh, you have to let your chest touch and you have to lift your hands up off the floor for a second. Uh, they are shockingly more difficult. You wouldn't think it would make that big a difference, but it's tough. Um, a sprint event uh, where they sprint as fast as they can over, I don't know how many yards. Um, a drag assessment where they also have to do like basically like a weight sled, uh, a carry assessment. Uh, a leg tuck, which is a great core assessment. That's actually basically knees to chest. Uh, and then a two mile run, just like before. So you can see like some of these are related to strength. Some of these are related to endurance and some of these are related to conditioning like your cardio. Um, but we don't see any like, uh, I guess there's one that's like speed, right? Um, they are gonna make somebody do like a speed assessment uh, where they have to sprint really quickly. So there is that, but we don't see any like agility or quickness. Um, they also don't really test, you know, if you ask me, they're not really testing for stability, which I think is very important, um, but pretty cool, you know, new version of that test that's out there. Um, now in sports, agility is one of the key things. So we're gonna look at a couple of versions of like agility assessments that we can perform as well, such as like a 5-10-5 or T uh, drill, uh, the less test, I'm uh, not the less test, uh, the left test. Um, that's always fun. Uh, <laughs> the left test, which is uh, a, a speed agil and agility assessment. Uh, but then there's also quickness assessments and quickness assessments are pretty rare for personal trainers to do on like a one-on-one -on -one client assessment. Like here's, here's the thing, you are probably going to apply some of the sports training stuff to your normal personal training sessions because it's a really great way to mix things up. It's really fun. Um, but quickness, as much as I think it's a blast and it's a great way to like break up the monotony of a training session is really something that's only important for athletes. And if you go back and remember our definitions for quickness, remember it's your reaction time, right? Um, it's how quickly your client can respond to an external stimulus. That's very much a sport specific thing. Like Maggie, if you are boxing, like you don't need to catch anything. When it comes to quickness drills, if I'm testing like how well you can catch something, I'm not really training you very effectively, but being able to move your head out of the way <laughs> is certainly, or like get your hands up and block something or like deflect somebody's arm as it's coming in, that's totally the type of quickness that's very relevant to that specific sport, right? So uh, quickness drills, this is the one that, uh, some, that I think like often doesn't get applied to like your standard personal training. Cause I know some people on the call right now are like, look, I'm not planning on being a coach. I'm not really work planning on working specifically with sports. I just want to work with regular clients uh, and focus on, aesthetic, you know, I want to be a bodybuilder or I want to focus on uh, weight loss and helping people or I want to focus on corrective exercise. You know, this Sports stuff may not directly apply to weight loss, but it's a really great way to do something that's fun and burn calories. And yeah, assessing for quickness, probably something you don't need to do. But like, let's say you are trying out, um, uh, let's say you are, you know, trying out for a football team, being able to run like a specific route and then like get to your mark in time, look over, why am I putting my hands over here? I'm looking over here. Uh, putting your hands up and being able to like turn and catch that football, right? Like that is a quickness drill. And so like there are going to be specific drills. They are limited in this book though. And this is what I've told you guys before where like uh, this book is very general. 
Um, and so I think like sometimes the impression is that like people will get this certification and be like, I can coach all sports. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's incredibly general. It's not specific. Um, it's a great foundation. And then you need to specialize in whatever your sport is because there's not a ton of assessments listed. Um, but yes, the, the speed agility and quickness drills are kind of part of the, the performance assessment section. Uh, and then lastly, conditioning drills, you know, uh, what type of condition is your cardiovascular system in? Uh, YMC three minute step test, rock bar walk test. Um, there's other versions that are more specific, like the pacer test, right? Uh, pacer test is a really good way to estimate your VO2. Um, so, uh, performance assessments are assessments related to the overall performance uh, and, uh, related to a specific event, um, such as stability, strength, power, speed, agility, quickness, or conditioning, right? Um, so uh, here are some really interesting ones that are in your book here um, that I don't really have pictures of, um, but a really good one is what's called the, uh, the double leg lowering test, uh, which is a core strength assessment. Um, it's a pretty cool one. It's actually where, uh, I think we showed it in our last class, where you inflate a blood pressure cuff um, underneath somebody's low back, and then they raise their legs up. And as they lower their legs, there's going to be a moment where all of a sudden they push with their low back onto that blood pressure cuff and you'll notice the pressure spike. Um, the moment that that happens, you're going to measure the angle at which like their legs are at. Uh, the lower the angle, the greater the core strength they have. Um, and so, well, I guess technically the higher the angle, <laughs> if you're measuring angles, <laughs> this would be 180, which would be a much higher number than this would be 90. Uh, <laughs> but like, you're going to measure like, um, the lower their legs were able to drop uh, closer to the ground, the greater their core strength is going to be. Uh, there's also the Sorensen erector spinae test where you actually have a client lay on their stomach uh, and then they're going to lift uh, with their upper back and they're going to hold that isometrically for as long as possible. And then slowly you'll see them like fall back down. Um, that's testing like how strong their low back is, which is important, right? Um, that's, by the way, that's like my kryptonite test. That is an assessment that I perform very poorly on. Uh, low back rounding, weak erector spinae. Uh, then we also have like the single leg star excursion test. Um, that is that lower extremity balance test, right? They're reaching out as far as they can uh, in all directions, right? Um, that is, uh, that's a, a performance assessment. And then you have your Davies test, right? Those are all really good examples. Um, of stability assessments, right? We're testing core strength, we're testing um, upper body agil uh, stabilization, really good examples there. Uh, but, and like I said, these are all in your book. Let me just show you so you can actually see what I'm talking about here. Um, this is the PDF I just sent you guys and this is what your book will look like. Uh, sort of, actually your book, there's a weird thing. Um, tell you what, I'll actually not reveal what it is and you guys tell me what the difference between this PDF is uh, versus your real textbook. I'll give you, a, it, it is the cover here. There's something slightly different about the cover. Um, so, uh, where are we at? That's chapter two, chapter three. Oh, by the way, this book does a way better job uh, than your regular textbook of giving you your body fat testing, um, levels like in the chapter rather than making you go to the back of the book and look it up. So that's kind of nice. Um, and there's all of our posture assessments that we've seen. Uh, single leg and, du and double leg. And then there's the, le there's the less test, right? Uh, and then here it is. Here's our, our uh, double leg lowering assessment, right? There's the star excursion assessment. There's the Sorensen erector spinae. Um, you know, can they, they hold that angle for at least 30 seconds? Um, Davies test. 
And then we get into our strength assessments, such as the 185 bench press assessment, um, which is similar to a one rep max assessment, but this one's more around endurance. So this is actually what's kind of interesting. Uh, there's a difference between the way like the priorities of like the NBA versus the priorities of the NFL. Um, the NFL, it's, it's how much can you bench, right? It's like a very heavy weight. Um, there's also the 185 bench press assessment, which is the, the uh, NBA version. And what they'll do is they'll put 185 and it's how many reps you can do. Um, so your one rep max isn't important. It's just, can you lift this minimum amount and do you have good endurance? Because if you've got somebody who's gonna be keeping their arms up for an, you know, trying to block uh, somebody for an entire game, uh, you better have upper body endurance. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, uh, squats, pull-ups, push-up assessments, all of those are related to strength, right? Um, then we have power assessments. These are kind of fun. Um, so strength assessments here, um, push-ups, pull-ups. Uh, and then we have like our explosive power assessments. And so what will happen is um, you will pick a, a medicine ball that, um, Oh, and by the way, like a lot of these assessments, remember performance assessments are like you versus future you. They're not really, there's not really like a minimum performance here, you know, uh, unless there are some categorized by your specific sport, you know, uh, like there are like specific tables where they're like, we consider this a good score. That's a bad score, right? Um, that's not how we as regular trainers normally apply these type of performance assessments. So like obviously a team might care about how many reps you can perform on the 185. Um, but if you're just training your client to do that, uh, then it's just them versus future them, right? Um, but the overhead medicine ball throw, uh, which is not pictured here, this is the rotation medicine ball throw. Um, but overhead medicine ball throw is literally the, what is called like the soccer throw assessment. Then you have a rotation assessment, right? Where they're throwing it like that. Um, and you just use a medicine ball to see like how far they can throw it. Here's the, uh, the reverse soccer throw where they go back over their head. Um, this, never do this in gyms because of what you are clearly seeing this in this picture. Um, anybody ever notice in our gym at Sochi, there is a giant hole in one of the ceiling tiles that's how it happened. <laughs> um, so uh, there's the soccer throw. Um, then we have like the double leg vertical assessment. That's a great power assessment. Um, these are really cool. Man, I actually could have gotten one of these for free. This is when I, I was still working. I just started at Sochi. Uh, and the, boot, the, the gym that I worked at in Malibu was like closing down and there was all this equipment left over from like a reality show that they had shot there. And I had one of these and I totally could have taken it. Uh, and I like asked the program director and he was like, nah, there's not really room in the gym. And so I didn't. And I really regret it. Cause I was like, we could have taken it down to the parking lot and done this. Uh, um, I'll never get another one of those things for free ever again or have a chance. Um, then there's the long jump assessment, which is literally just how far forward you can jump. There's the single leg hop assessment. Remember the difference between like a jump is two legged and a hop is one legged. Um, oh, we lost wrap for a second. Uh, and so like that version here, this is actually, um, you can see he's jumping with the same side leg. Uh, you can do that version. You could also do jump uh, with your opposite leg. Um, you know, jump from one leg to the other. That's one way to do it. Or you could just do a single leg jump assessment uh, this way. Uh, this, the original version is uh, same leg to same leg. Um, then there's the shark's skill assessment. Uh, this is a little bit like, this is again, where I'm like kind of disagreeing with some of the stuff of the way they have it labeled here. But again, they aren't gonna ask you like where these belong in categories, uh, which is good because NASM is horribly inconsistent here. Uh, but the shark skill assessment is definitely an agility assessment, not power. Um, you're, it has nothing to do with power. You know, it's all about uh, directional change, not about like how far you're actually jumping maximally. Um, so if you ask me, there's no way this belongs in the power category, but whatever. Um, I didn't write the textbook. Uh, <laughs> so then we get into our speed, agility, and, and quickness assessments. Um, speed, remember, is literally just how fast you can travel from point A to point B, right? 
Uh, agility is all about how quickly you can change directions without losing too much speed. Uh, and quickness is your reaction time. So in a, a speed assessment would literally be a 10 yard dash, 20 yard dash, 30 yard dash, or the classic 40 yard, right? Um, 40 yard dash uh, or 40 yard sprint. So those are kind of the, the, the classic versions of speed assessments. Um, and there it is, there's the 40 all by itself. Um, then you've got something called the left test. The left test is speed, but it's also somewhat agility because there's going to be directional changes. Remember we did this, uh, when we did like our little workshop, but it's a sprint back pedal, side shuffle, side shuffle, karaoke, karaoke, sprint. Uh, and Deborah, we had your friend who was like knocking it out. She was a rock star. Uh, <laughs> um, so that is our left test. Then we have another agility assessment like the 510 five drill. Um, somebody was asking about this when we did it, right? But it's where you set yourself up uh, three cones. You're gonna sit in the center. Uh, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna sprint to one side, sprint all the way to the other side, and then you sprint back to the center. Um, you do need to touch these two cones. You need to start with your hand on the center cone, sprint, touch this cone, sprint, touch this cone. You do not need to touch this cone as you're going by uh, in most examples. Um, do they say you need to touch it in this one? Uh, uh, I think I'm looking at the wrong assessment. That's real life. Yeah, they don't say to touch it. So uh, in the last one, you just have to sprint through. So like you're literally just going to time it. Um, the moment they cross through. So like you should try not to like try to sprint to this cone at the end. You're trying to really just sprint all the way through it. Try to pick up speed as fast as you can. Um, actually, we'll pull up a picture of the 510, 510, because this is such a cool drill. Yeah. How long is that video? <laughs> Let's do the one minute and 30 second one. Great morning start with the mattress from Ashley. I know you are not going to sell me a mattress. I'm so tired of Ashley Furniture. All right. Welcome to the Pro Agility Drill. The Pro Agility, also known as the 525, gives an incredible understanding of your ability to move left and right and change direction. That's kind of cool. They're using cameras. You'll be asked to set up on the center one. You just be shoulder width apart, loaded down into a good athletic base. You start with your hand contacting the cone over the ground. Your left hand on that center white line. With just enough energy to touch the line, but not so much that you're leaning forward. You'll then aggressively cut out of your stance. Moving to your left, you will take a series of steps loading into that first cut. As I go to my left, I put my left hand on that white line putting as much energy as I can into my inside leg with the intention of sprinting back the other way. As I approach that other cut line, I will then load into my right side, putting my right hand on the ground. Once I have finished that final cut, I will sprint back through my shadow where I originally started the drill. Performing this drill to the best of your ability shows yourself an incredible capacity to change direction, and that is what matters when the defense is coming your way on the field of play. So uh, it's a great running, it's a great agility drill. Um, and you will see people like, you know, they'll work at learning how to like accelerate and like how to pass those drills. You know, you do the lean uh, over the camera to even increase your score. Um, so that's the 510 five. Uh, there's also the 505, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, it's pretty similar, 505 uh, agility test. Um, We'll look up one more and then I, I won't, so I promise won't spend the rest of the day watching videos. Uh, frontal plane speed testing cutting. Um, one of the drills we would like to utilize is a 505 or a 505 drill. All right, so instead of a standard start in the center, we're going to start on the outside. Uh, why I like this drill is one, you get more true uh, change of direction. So you're getting a, an acceleration all the way to the other side, a true plant with how fast you're running at top end speed, and then driving through uh, the center to get that last five yards. So the cones are about five yards apart. All right, Jake's going to start in a good base position here, and this is going to be non-reactive. So Jake's going to go when he wants to, all right? So he's going to plant on his left side and drive through the center. All right, whenever you're ready, Jake. Good. 
play it through, drive over, and good. Great job. So, um, okay, well, I guess that's the end of the video. So what he does is he sprints all the way through, um, touches the one side of the cone, and then sprints back in the middle. The second he gets past like that center cone, so he's gonna go from here all the way down to here, and then the second he crosses the middle, that's actually when the assessment is over. So that's your five zero five drill. Um, again, that is uh, an agility drill. Now he actually, the guy in the video mentioned something um, that was particular. If you are just testing for agility, you can let the client determine when they want to go. Um, they can perform it uh, whenever, um, whenever they decide to start. And if you've got cameras set up or if you've got the stopwatch there, you just start at the moment they start moving. Uh, he called it a non-reactive drill. It wasn't based on his reaction time. Um, if you want to do a test somebody's quickness and how fast they respond to something, you could have like a whistle or you could say go. Um, and that would just ever so slightly change the assessment because now it's all it's based on how agile they are, but it's also based on how quickly they can respond to something. Because remember, so, that's what quickness is, right? It's a it's a response to an external stimulus. So is that for both the five ten five and the five zero five? Yeah, you could apply it in both directions. It depends on like what sport you're playing, you know? Like do you think that it's important to also test your quickness ability to like follow like you know is there a lot of audible cues in whatever sport you're playing then i would say you would probably want to do like an audible version right um uh but if it's really just like agility based on like their own performance and stuff then maybe it's less important um both are good both are, are totally legitimate in their own way um so there's a few more there's the t-test uh the t-test is is a cone drill where um actually there's a, a bunch here uh, but like uh, three quarter sprint, right? That's a very much like a basketball drill. Pro lane agility. This is kind of a fun one where you, um, uh, where's the first starting point? Yeah, it's in the corner here. Um, so you're gonna start uh, by sprinting and then you perform like a box drill, uh, sprint, side shuffle, back pedal, side shuffle. Uh, and then you actually do that over the course of your, your court here. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, basically just like a big box drill. Um, it doesn't even, it's not even in the shape of a T. What's the point of calling it a T test? Oh, that's this test. That's, that's, this is the, um, this is the pro agility drill test. Um, sorry, I was making a pit stop. Uh, <laughs> I liked that drill back in the day. Um, <laughs> the T test is this one, the T drill. Um, this is very similar. Remember the left test was the uh, sprint, backpedal, karaoke, karaoke. I'm sorry, sprint, backpedal, side shuffle, side shuffle, karaoke, karaoke, sprint. This is similar to that. You're going to sprint, side shuffle, karaoke, side shuffle, back pedal. So all the components are here again, but it's performed in a T version. Um, I like the T test, but man, I almost always miss the cone during the freaking back pedal portion. <laughs> so that's like, uh, that's a kind of a fun one. Um, so anyway, there's a lot more out there uh, that exist, but there's some really good options in this textbook that have got some fun ones. Um, what I recommend is like throw some of these into your routine. Like if you are outdoor, like working out right now, I mean, pandemic world gyms, you know, gyms are supposed to open today, but if you're still doing some stuff out in the world, throw some of these in, it's kind of fun. Um, and then lastly, we've got our conditioning assessments uh, in, per, in the performance category, uh, like your cardio respiratory stuff. So there's the Harvard step test. Um, which is basically your, your three minute step test that we're used to uh, from your regular textbook. Um, there is also the shuttle test. Um, this is the pacer test that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this is where you're gonna set cones 20 meters apart. Now you'll notice there's a lot of cones set up here. They're just showing that um, because uh, you could actually do this assessment with a bunch of athletes all at once. Uh, this is a classic cardio assessment that you can do with a ton of people simultaneously uh, because their score is just based on whatever round they make it to. And so what you do is you've got it 20 meters apart and somebody is going to, you play this specific track. This will be the last video I showed today. Um, uh, pacer test audio. Um, I won't play the whole thing, but. Oh, you want to sell cool. your knowledge online? 
we were ad free and then I triggered it. Capacity <laughs> test that progressively gets more difficult as it continues. The 20 meter pacer test will begin in 30 seconds. Line up at the start. The running speed starts slowly, but gets faster each minute after you hear this signal. A single <laughs> lap should be completed each time you hear this sound. Remember <laughs> to run in a straight line and run as long as possible. The second time you fail to complete a lap before the sound, your test is over. The test will begin on the word start. On your mark, get ready, start. All right, that's about enough of that. So anyway, when you do it, uh, you can have a bunch of people lined up and they all go, and then they wait, and then it beeps again and they run, and they wait, and it beeps again and they run. Um, but what will happen is the beeps get quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, and so uh, they have used this assessment similarly to the Rockport walk test. Uh, let's say, you know, you've got somebody there, you've got a clipboard, you're training 20 people. I'm sorry, you're assessing 20 people. Uh, and it's like this person dropped out in round 10, that person dropped out in round 12, uh, 13, and then somebody made it to round 14. Uh, you would use that to look at a chart. Um, pacer test chart results. Um, and so you can see this chart here, you know, uh, if they are X number of years old, you know, um, how many rounds they made it to, uh, that's going to give you an estimate of like how well they performed there. Um, that's a really simple version. There's actually VO2 versions. Yeah. Um, where's the ones with the actual VO2 score? Yeah, that's all the classic. These, that's when you use it for kids. Um, VO2. You don't test VO2 for kids because they don't have uh, that style. There we go. So, um, yeah, these are their, their average VO2s up here. So that's kind of cool, right? Kind of a cool assessment that you can do with like a bunch of people. Um, oh. <laughs> I Googled it. Here's the chart. <laughs> Those are the VO2s. Um, all right. Then you have a one mile run. You know how quickly they, they performed a, a one mile performance assessment. Um, so those are all of our kind of main categories there. Um, did that make sense to everybody in terms of like, uh, you start to see how like this could apply to specific athletes. By the way, you don't need to do all of these assessments. Like that's not the goal here. I mean, you could, you could know literally everything there is to know about somebody if you were to assess them for like eight hours, you know? Um, but the goal here is really to pick the ones that are you feel are most important to your specific sport. Uh, and I'll actually give you an example of that right here. I'm gonna skip all the way down to the back of this book. Um, one of the coolest things about this textbook is it actually has some really good uh, common coaching programs in the back. Um, so I'm just going to start with the first one, which I'm sure is football, because uh, it's, you know, uh, oh no, the first one's baseball. Um, so sports specific programs, right? So it'll have a little bit of information about the sport. Um, so the demands of the sport uh, for specific uh, special positions like general versus pitchers and catchers who obviously are a little different. Um, and then here you can see what suggested assessments are important for baseball, according to NASA. Uh, overhead, single leg, Harvard step test, uh, the double leg vertical jump, uh, the rotation medicine ball throw, uh, and then their timed assessments are going to be like home to first base, home to second base, home to third, uh, in infield home run. The left test is going to be a good one, uh, the shuttle test, the 300 yard shuttle test, um, the one mile run, Davies test, squats and pull ups. Um, so that's what we care about. You don't see the 185 bench press assessment on here, but not that that's not a good assessment. It's just not very specific to something like baseball. Um, then there's some pre-written programs. So I'm going to skip past those. Uh, I will stop for just a pit stop right here, though. Here's an example of like what the in-season training might look like. Um, so you would basically stay in corrective exercise, stabilization, and occasionally strength endurance. Um, baseball is one of the only 
examples of a sport where you actually do still kind of train for strength mid season. Uh, and the only reason for that is because freaking baseball season is a million years long. Um, so you want to make sure that you kind of don't miss out on that. Uh, basketball, take a look. You're going to see um, uh, the suggested assessments are a little bit different. Overhead and single leg is still the same. Harvard step test is going to be a little more applicable. Um, double leg vertical jump, single leg vertical jump, uh, vertical straight up jump, uh, the sharks test, right? Three quarter court sprint, left test, pro agility drill, uh, which is that box drill we were talking about, Davies test, um, uh, and then the 185 bench press, which is the only strength assessment they care about. So, you know, each sport's going to have some different, uh, different assessments that are, are sort of most applicable to it. But at the end of the day, um, you are really just assessing your client, uh, their current condition versus like, you know, their future condition. Uh, any questions on that guys? Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Sounds good, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> you're uh, you're coming out very <laughs> very uh, interesting sounding right now, Frankie. Sounds like an alien. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what are you talking about? It. Uh, I can't repl. I don't know. I can't replicate it. So I don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, I'm solid for now. Oh, uh, don't, don't even sweat it. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and look at our second PowerPoint here. Uh, this will move very quickly because uh, it is all the basic flexibility assessments or uh, flexibility stuff we've talked about in the past. So uh, this is going to be chapter four, flexibility training for performance enhancements. Uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to fit that in a YouTube title. Ugh, thinking about my future. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So um, we know that flexibility is obviously a really important part of uh, training any client, but particularly athletes, right? Um, oh, gotcha. No problem, Frankie. We'll see you. See you tomorrow. Uh, whoop, we won't. We'll see you. See you Monday. <laughs> um, so uh, we need to be able to explain how muscle imbalances affect us. Uh, we need to understand the rationale behind flexibility training, which we've talked about before, our different flexibility techniques, which is always a primary focus, uh, and how to perform those techniques. So uh, if we really quickly just review like our kinetic chain in general, right? We talk about uh, the kinetic chain being the interconnectivity of the skeletal, nervous, and muscular systems. Um, if this system, your muscular system gets overactive or underactive due to a lack of flexibility, it is going to affect how your skeletal system moves, but it's also going to affect how your nervous system, you know, uh, interprets information, you know, that's what poor posture is a lot of times, you know, talk to your clients about like noticing their shoulder rounding they go like, I don't rounded shoulders. And it's like, Oh my God. Right. Like they, they're going to feel like the big difference there. Um, but their brain has been telling them consistently that like they are, you know, looking and performing one way versus another. Um, so, uh, we need to be able to kind of identify that. Usually that's the kind of stuff that you identify through posture assessments, overhead squat, single leg squat, um, pushing and pulling assessments. Those are the kind of the three main ones that we use. Um, but the idea here is really to learn how to maintain proper flexibility, right? Ideal posture. Um, so uh, that is going to reduce your risk of injury uh, and reduce tissue overload. So three key concepts that we got to have in terms of like flexibility. Uh, we need to understand these effects that it has on the kinetic chain. So effects of altered pro, um, flexibility on the kinetic chain are going to include these three kind of main things. Uh, but the first one we are going to see is altered reciprocal inhibition. Um, so remember, I want you to recall, actually, and I'll put it in the notes. Actually, yeah, we'll do it this way. So uh, altered reciprocal inhibition is where a tight agonist decreases the neural drive of its functional antagonist. 
right? So I'll give you an example of that, right? Tight or overactive hip flexors decrease the strength of the gluteus maximus, right? So your glutes literally cannot function properly because your hip flexors are so tight. You're pulling so much in one direction that you're not allowing it to pull in the other. Um, I always like to use fake numbers to kind of highlight this, but like imagine you are trying, you get on a glute kickback machine at the gym and you're trying to do like those kickbacks there, right? Um, imagine you're trying to do that and you put the pin on, I don't know, 100 pounds, right? Uh, you're trying to do a 100 pound glute kickback, but you have really overactive hip flexors, which are passively pulling for, we'll say 10 pounds of force, right? So your glute doesn't need to generate 100 pounds to move that way. It needs to generate 110 pounds. It's weaker because it's losing tension. You're pulling in the opposite direction. It's like having two teams of people like doing a tug of war. And then one of your guys on your team just leaves goes to the other team and starts pulling in the other, other direction. It's like, John, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> um, that is altered reciprocal inhibition. Um, so I do want you to make sure that you keep this term in your head properly though. Remember, that's the altered or messed up reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition is a normal physiologic process. Um, uh, is a a physiological process whereby uh, when an antagonist muscle, when an agonist muscle contracts, the antagonist relaxes. So normal reciprocal inhibition, like what's normally supposed to happen is like, if I wanna squeeze my glute, my hip flexor turns off. But if my hip flexor is overactive, and it doesn't turn off, now I have altered or effed up uh, <laughs> reciprocal inhibition, um, altered reciprocal inhibition instead. Um, so uh, any questions on that one? Everybody pretty clear on that? I know we've, we've kind of been over this, so um, if I am doing too detailed, just let me know. Uh, so then we also have, so what that leads to, right? So now that I can't recruit my glute the way I'm supposed to, now what's going to happen is a synergist muscle is going to kick in and it's going to start, try to start doing the work. So oftentimes altered reciprocal inhibition will lead to what we call synergistic dominance, right? And this is where uh, synergist muscles actually take over for weak or inhibited prime movers, right? Um, so uh, occurs when a synergist um, muscle takes over for a weak or inhibited prime mover. So I mean, that's a half good thing, right? Like, I mean, it's like, it's good that I'm still getting the motion done. Like I'm still, you know, I'm doing my glute kickbacks at the gym. I'm able to perform the movement if I'm trying to show off or something. Uh, but I'm definitely not moving the way I'm designed to move. I'm in fact training my nervous system to now use my hamstrings instead of my glutes to perform that motion. So again, my muscular system is now altering not only my skeletal system, because here's the thing, now I'm putting more pressure behind my knee joint, less pressure at the hip joint. My low back is probably arching, um, which is putting more pressure on my spine. So yeah, I'm affecting my skeletal system like in a very direct way, but in an indirect way, I'm also affecting my nervous system. My nervous system is now learning how to do a glute kickback the wrong way. It's recruiting the wrong muscles. Um, so uh, a good example is an inhibited gluteus maximus cannot perform hip extension effectively, so the hamstrings assist uh, by performing hip extension instead, right? Um, so what all that ends up leading to, right? My altered reciprocal inhibition leads to arthrokinetic dysfunction. So one term that I'm surprised I'm not seeing here uh, that I'm going to put up first before arthrokinetic dysfunction, actually, is I'm going to put up relative flexibility. So this often leads to what we call relative flexibility, uh, which is a process 
by which the um, body finds the path of least resistance during a functional movement. Uh, and the reason I'm putting that there is because you will often see these three things labeled out together, uh, whether it's on your test or whether it's being taught to you. It's like uh, overactive muscle causes altered reciprocal inhibition, which leads to synergistic dominance, which leads to f relative flexibility. And that's what leads to arthrokinetic dysfunction, right? So what will happen is like, yeah, you got the job done, but you got it done by doing it the wrong way. It's relative, like you got it done, but you're not really designed to move that way. Yes, you're flexible, but you're not actually flexible. You're not moving the way you're designed to move. So relative flexibility is where your body finds the path of least resistance during a movement. Um, that will often lead to arthrokinetic dysfunction, aka your bones get messed up. Uh, so that is the biomechanical dysfunction in two articular partners, big fancy way of saying joints, uh, <laughs> that leads to abnormal joint movement or arthro. Actually, we can just leave it at joint movement. That is, that is literally what arthrokinematics is. Um, I hate the word arthrokinematics. It's a word that's longer than the definition. <laughs> um, but arthrokinematics is literally joint motion. So um, arthrokinetic dysfunction is like now your skeletal system moves the way it's not really designed to move. You know, um, you can see an example of this in clients who have like stenosis. Uh, or like uh, arthritis in the low back, you'll notice there's less space between their joints. Um, their discs are compressed. And so that means that like they're wrenching their spine in different directions more than somebody who should be flexible. So uh, these are really why we're talking about flexibility today. And so that leads us to our muscle fiber structure. Remember a muscle fiber is an individual muscle cell. Uh, you're going to have your endomesium, which is that innermost layer. Then you're going to wrap that uh, a bunch of uh, muscle cells together uh, to make up a paramecium, which is what we call a fascicle. And then the epimecium is the outer layer surrounding your entire like muscle itself. Um, you've seen the epimecium uh, a lot of times that's sometimes referred to as like fascia. Um, if you've ever cut through like the silver skin on like a piece of meat or something. Um, so your muscle fibers are arranged into little tiny bundles that we like to call fascicles, right? Um, so a fascicle, so actually we'll look at the uh, structure of a muscle fiber here, structure of muscles, right? Uh, you're going to have a fascicle, which is a bundle of muscle fibers held together with uh, connective tissue, right? Um, so that's what a fascicle is. And then inside uh, of an each uh, a muscle fiber, I'm going to just do it slightly different because um, this is worded kind of weirdly, but a muscle fiber is going to be an individual muscle cell uh, that houses the specialized myofilaments. And your myofilaments are going to be your actin and your myosin, right? Um, so actin uh, is the thin filament that has binding sites uh, that allow myosin uh, to bind and create muscular contractions. So uh, the thin filament that has all brand, uh, <laughs> the thin filament has all the binding sites that the little club-like heads want to reach up and grab. That's what creates the sliding action in the sliding filament model. Then we have myosin here, which is the thick filament. That has a club like heads that reach out and bind to actin uh, to create muscular contractions, right? So actin and myosin pull closer together. 
uh, and they draw the muscle fiber in on itself and shorten it. Uh, that is happening in thousands of muscle fibers simultaneously, and that's why your muscle goes from being this long to being that long, and that is what we call a concentric contraction. Um, I'm going to put troponin and tropomyosin up here as well. Uh, troponin and tropomyosin. I know some of you guys are getting like flashbacks, like, no, not again. Uh, <laughs> uh, but troponin and tropomyosin are the regulatory proteins housed on the actin strand that keep myosin from binding during a relaxed muscle. Okay, uh, so when your muscle is relaxing, it's because those binding sites are there blocking myosin from being able to bind with its precious actin. Um, so that leads us to a super cool concept uh, called the all or nothing principle. Um, so this is a kind of important thing to remember about muscles. Um, all or no none principle. So this is what's kind of cool about your muscles. Uh, and this might kind of kind of sound surprising if I haven't been over this yet. But when a muscle fiber contracts, um, when, a, uh, when a muscle fiber contracts, it is uh, stimulated 100% or not at all. Um, basically, what that's saying is muscle fibers contract completely or not at all. So uh, that's kind of interesting, right? When you think about like an individual muscle fiber, if it is told by the nervous system to contract, it will contract as hard as it can 100% of the time, no matter what, or it will not contract at all. Um, so that's kind of interesting when you think about it. I always uh, use this example here because this is what's kind of surprising about that. You're like, wait, 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 wait. That can't be true because like, what about like when I go to deadlift like a super heavy weight versus like when I go to pick up my cat, right? Like if I contracted 100% every time and I went to pick up my cat, I'd be like, Whoa! you know, like, and that would be horrible. <laughs> um, so how is it that we have, you know, strong contractions versus weak contractions? Well, strong contractions and weak contractions are determined by how many muscle fibers you are recruiting to get the job done. So your muscle fiber will always contract for 100% of its strength, but maybe this muscle fiber gets contracted and maybe this one over here and this one over here and that one over there, but these guys on this part, they just relax. They don't really do anything. Um, that is a weaker contraction versus a really strong contraction where you're recruiting mu maximal muscle fibers. And that's why when we're training for maximal strength, we have to, or if we're training for power, we have to remember the all or none principle. Sometimes people have asked me, they're like, uh, when we get to the max strength phase, um, pop quiz, how much time do we rest in the max strength phase? You'll see in, in three to five minutes. Three to five minutes, right? Good Lord, that is a long amount of time to take, a lot of, to take a rest, right? Like, um, you're resting three to five minutes. Now you'll see a chart here. I'll, I'll pull this up because this is actually in your book as well. Um, uh, rest period uh, and ATP recovery. You'll see a chart here. Uh, when you look at rest periods, take a look at this. 30 seconds, you get about 50% of your ATP back. One minute, you get about, actually, this is not accurate. Is wrong. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. Let me pull up a better chart. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, I mean, it's not that it's not possible. I mean, it could be accurate. I'm just, it's not the one that's in your NASA book. So I don't want to have a con. 
contradicting information. Uh, yeah, there's this one, but that's not what I'm looking for. That's the, as you're using it. Let's try this. <laughs> no, come on, help me out. If I knew what PowerPoint is, I could just pull it up in 10 seconds. It wouldn't be that hard. Ugh. What about this one? Well, what about this one? I haven't closed. ATP recovery. Oh, I can't find it. All right. Um, so everybody slap an asterisk in the end of your brain uh, as I pull this up. Um, it's not that this couldn't possibly be accurate. You know, like depending on which certification you're getting, everybody is using different uh, research to, to kind of highlight things. Um, but we'll go with this just to see it for now because it's going to highlight my point that I'm making. Um, okay, so in 30 seconds, you're going to recover about 50% of your ATP. That is pretty accurate. One minute, according to NASM, is going to put you at 90% recovery, not 75. Um, 90 seconds is about 87%. Two minutes is about 93. 230 is 97. So kind of a, we're seeing a big jump between like one minute and 230. And then three minutes, you get about like 98.5%. Um, so if you have like 98.5% of your ATP recovered at the three minute mark, why the heck do you need to rest another full two minutes in any scenario? Why do you guys think that might be? I'll give you a hint. We are talking about the all or nothing principle, so it's probably relevant to what we're talking about currently. <laughs> why do you guys think we would recover another two minutes beyond? For synchronization and... Uh and more motor to recruit them as many motor units as possible and and fire protection there we go very good yeah um so it's not always just about atp remember your nervous system is dictating how your muscular system works so a lot of times we think of recovery we think about like resting between sets we always think of like oh atp recovery that's why i'm resting so that i can have enough energy to do my next set but it's also, if I'm training for maximal strength, maximal strength is dictated by how efficient my nervous system recruits my muscle fibers. And part of that is motor unit synchronization. It's about like, you know, what, like imagine like, go back to the tug of war scenario. You've got like a team of people all pulling, right? Well, what would happen if I were pulling as hard as I can and then I need to redo my grip and I pull as hard as I can, but in that like little half second where I redid my grip, the person behind me, they're pulling as hard as they can. And then when I'm pulling as hard as I can, they reset their grip. We are not synchronized. So what ends up happening is like, we're gonna lose function overall. The amount of strength that we're, the power that we're pulling for goes down. But if I'm standing behind the person, if I've got somebody behind me, I'm like, okay, ready? One, two, three, pull. And we both pull as hard as we can, reset our grips at the same time. One, two, three, pull. And we both pull at the same time again that's going to be a much, much, much more powerful contraction because I'm giving it my all at the same time my teammate is giving it their all. We're not losing synchronization. So if that's how your muscle fibers work, they need to be synchronized to be as efficient as possible to lift super heavily. You need to make sure that you're also giving your brain time to turn those neurons off in between sets. It's not always about ATP recovery. It's also about resetting the system so that you can train for maximal strength every single set. Because like, and you guys have probably done that. Anybody in the call or anybody watching the video right now, if you've ever done a super heavy maximal lift and then like you set it down, you'll notice you're like walking away kind of jittery, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, that's a super exaggeration, but like you'll notice like your hands kind of shake a little bit and like, you're a little amped up. That's literally because your nervous system is like, what the hell did we just lift? <sighs> like, what are we fighting? You know, <laughs> like your nervous system is turned on. If you want to like synchronize it, you got to give it time to turn back off and reset. So that's very much related to this all or nothing principle here. Um, we want to make sure that we take 
rest periods. And this is really relevant to this course, right? Like, like we're in the sports mind. We are talking about maximum strength. We're talking about power. Um, so I want you guys to keep this in mind. Work hard, but also rest hard. <laughs> um, that's also really important. Um, so uh, kind of going back through everything, uh, we've got some connected tissue here, right? Your muscles are going to end in a tendon. Um, you've also got connective tissue that's holding your bones together. So uh, our two primary types of like tissues that kind of hold everything together, uh, you're also gonna have tendons, which are any uh, connective tissue that uh, connects muscles to bone. Uh, no, <laughs> all right, we got you, no problem. Um, so we got uh, connected tendons or connected tissue that attaches muscles to bones. Uh, and then we've got ligaments, which is connective tissue that attaches bones to bones, right? Both those are really important when it comes to like flexibility, right? Um, any adhesions that occur in either of those uh, are going to lead to like dysfunction in your flexibility. And again, that could lead to overactivity which will result in recipro altered reciprocal inhibition, synergistic dominance, relative flexibility, and eventually arthrokinetic dysfunction. Um, so here it's gonna go through some more anatomy, uh, your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. I'm not gonna go back through those with you guys, um, but your central nervous system is like the command center. Your peripheral nervous system communicates with the command center, right? Um, your peripheral nervous system are all of your peripheral nerves. So your brain makes a decision, it travels down your spine, then it gets into the peripheral nervous system and it recruits whatever muscle it's supposed to recruit. Uh, and then in the opposite direction, going back to your brain, your, your muscle picks up information, sends it to the spine, it travels up to your brain, your brain interprets that information, and there's the cycle. Um, that whole system is made up of individual neurons, right? Uh, which is the functional unit of your nervous system. And it has its different layers too. The inner layer, endo, right? Uh, the middle layer, which is uh, perineurium. And the epineurium, which is the kind of fascia of your nervous system, is sort of wrapping everything together. So um, this is where we kind of have to understand that like acute injury is like one that happens once uh, or chronic injuries, the type that happen all the time, will affect your nervous system's tissues. You know, we all know people who have like a higher pain tolerance than somebody else, you know, uh, and that's like simply because, you know, those pain receptors have actually become desensitized because they are used to being in a specific type of pain. Um, it's funny, but like my right hamstring is way tighter than my left. Um, but when I go to get like a massage, uh, if they do like my hamstrings, like my right, I'm so used to dealing with like the tightness in my right that my pain receptors have become less sensitive. And so I'll be like, oh, that's not so bad. And then like they'll start working on my left and I'm like, woo, ah, <laughs> you know, like I start jumping off the table. Um, and it's just because like I'm not used to that uncomfortable sensation in my left side. So uh, we do know that like trauma will stimulate those pain receptors. Those are called your nociceptors. Um, and that will often cause little micro spasms within your muscle. This is where you guys have heard me say, um, okay, like there, we are moving away from, like there's been more and more research to indicate that we shouldn't foam roll our IT band. You know, um, like when I got trained, like foam rolling your IT band was standard practice. It was like, hey, you got to foam roll the IT band. It's one of the tightest areas of the body. And so you foam roll it and try to work all that fascia out. Um, but modern research has indicated that that is such a painful sensation for so many people that it actually creates more spasming afterwards. And then the muscle actually ends up tightening up. Um, and so like in the end, that actually results in more dysfunction that it solves. Um, so that's what microspasms are. If you, or if you just like, you know, uh, pull a muscle during a workout, it might not have been all that severe, but like that trauma will create like little adhesions within your muscle. Your, your muscle will go, holy crap, we got torn in these fibers. I need to protect those fibers. And it will literally contract itself. And then like 
it'll be flexible on maybe like let's say I my butt my torso here is like the spasm part of the tissue and I've got like my arms here you know I'm a muscle fiber right from fingertip to fingertip <laughs> um, if I've got like trauma I might pull myself in like this and now like this doesn't have to contract and I'll be flexible here and here instead um, you will literally see things like that if we look at like a muscular adhesion um, you look at like, you know, this fibrous tissue, uh, this is what we call scar tissue, right? So you're flexible over here and you're flexible over here, but this is all blocked up. It's not really going to allow you to be very flexible. Um, that's why torn muscles and things like that, uh, often are like so commonly like reoccurring, uh, because you can literally see where like that tissue becomes less elastic that alters the way you move and then you end up moving the wrong way and then you end up with an injury um which i think is actually going to be hold on just a second i'm going to skip forward just a little bit see if it's coming up yeah that's what we call the cumulative injury cycle um tissue trauma results in inflammation which results in a spasm which results in an adhesion which results in altered control of that muscle now you have a muscle imbalance where you have an overactive and underactive muscle, which results in tissue trauma, and it's a big cycle. Uh, by the way, this was Mo's interview. <laughs> he spoke on this for like a half hour, uh, and that's how he got hired. Um, ask him about it sometimes, it's a fun story. So um, that can limit your flexibility, right? That can obviously uh, lead to a limit in the way we move. Um, now. Uh, as we get older, that's also something that can affect the way we move. Uh, we do know that like atrophy or sarcopenia, um, as we get older will result in like decreased flexibility. Uh, we also know that immobilization will result in decreased flexibility. You know, for instance, if you're in a cast, uh, or in a sling or something like that, um, your muscle stays in one position for a really long time, your nervous system learns how to stay in that position, your muscles stay in that position, they all stay in a shortened state. Um, so then that ends up leading to uh, decreased flexibility and altered neuromuscular control. So uh, these are some terms, I don't think these are gonna show up in your homeworks or anything, uh, but this is where we have to remember like, you know, your muscles are relatively elastic, right? They have kind of a spring-like, um, uh, a spring-like quality to them. Uh, they, they, you know, when you pull them, they kind of naturally want to snap back together. Um, that is what we consider like elasticity. There's also like viscoelasticity, which is like uh, sort of the property that allows them to kind of stay in one position. Uh, stay in one position. Imagine like a piece of steak that you poke with your finger. It kind of has that. It looks like memory foam mattress. Um, oh God, I mentioned mattresses. I'm gonna get more ads. Uh, <laughs> but it leaves like a little dent for a little while. That's kind of like what viscoelasticity is. And then plasticity is permanent changes. So like when you stay in one position for a super long time, uh, your body adapts to that position. So those are kind of things we need to remember about our muscles. They are squishy, they are elastic, but they're also prone to when you leave them in one position for super extended periods, they are prone to staying in that position. They get comfortable like that. And again, you're at a desk job and you're typing like this all day, your body gets used to being in this position. That's what leads to upper cross syndrome, lower cross syndrome, things like that. And again, this is what leads to, you know, the reason we kind of need to mention this stuff is because like, your clients are gonna be like, hey, I've been working on this flexibility and it's not getting better. It's like, well, remember you developed this posture over 30, 40, 40 years of your life. You know, a couple training sessions are not gonna make that go away. It's gonna take a long time to kind of work on this and we're gonna to need to be conscious of it. Um, so that leads me to uh, two principles here, which are actually important for you to remember. Um, I don't think these are in your regular test, but I do know they're in the corrective one. Uh, and these are called Davis's Law and Wolf's Law. And they are basically, I mean, Wolf's Law is basically a variation of Davis's Law. Um, but Davis's Law, is that how I do that? Davis's Law is, uh, right, let's try this. Yeah, it's fine. 
<laughs> um, is, is basically going to say that soft tissue uh, model, loft tissue, soft tissue models along the lines of stress, right? And what that's saying is basically whatever stress you put on the body, um, the body will adapt to that position. Um, so whatever stress you place on the body, body will model itself along that stress. So, uh, this is part of the reason why, um, when you talk to like a massage therapist, who's trying to break up some scar tissue, um, you know, they'll work with the grain of your muscle. Then you'll go kind of against the grain of your muscle, but you will always then go back to the grain of the muscle because you don't want the muscle fibers to kind of be pulled apart randomly. You want them to all kind of stay in alignment. That's why we roll along like our tissue lines. Uh, and it's why we lift specifically at the angles that we lift at because those are modeling uh, our muscles in the direction they're supposed to go, right? Um, rather than pulling in random directions, that result in different types of stress. Um, so basically, uh, your body will model. It. This is again, again, this is a classic example of like function. I'm even going to put that up here. Like function follows form, and form follows function. Right? Um, whatever stress you place on the body, your body will adapt to that type of stress. If you stay in one specific posture for too long, your body will get sort of used to that. Um, didn't your mom ever tell you if you made funny faces one day, the wind would change and it'll get stuck that way. Uh, she wasn't necessarily wrong. <laughs> so, uh, there's also Wolf's law, which is kind of basically the same thing. Um, uh, but basically talking about hard tissue, uh, but bone in a healthy person or animal will adapt to the loads it's placed under. So basically, uh, Davis's law is like soft tissue and Wolf's law is like hard tissue, but both, both of them are related to like function following form. You know, um, if you look a certain way, you're going to act a certain way. And if you act a certain way, it'll make you look a certain way. It's all interconnected. Um, so we're talking about all this because we were talking about the cumulative injury cycle. You know, we got to understand that like sports as great as they are and burning calories and making an athletic body, we do have to remember like in order to be good at that sport, you're kind of doing the same motions over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and yeah, that makes you super like effective at that sport. But like, this is where, man, this is where the conversation gets a little touchy. Um, and kind of challenging, right? Uh, because it's like, you know, your sport is what you kind of care the most about. Like me, for instance, like I love ultimate. Um, it's my favorite sport. I, you know, I, I basically build my life around it. Um, but like, sometimes people ask me, they're like, hey, like as a personal trainer, like, you know, why don't you get into like bodybuilding? Like, why, why don't you focus on like, kind of building up and, and, you know, having like a, like just doing hypertrophy training all the time. And it's like, well, it's not related to like the sport that I play, you know, like I'm doing a lot of cardio because that's, I want to be able to run for an entire game. I don't want to get tired between points. Um, so what's important to me is like the cardio aspect of things. Um, and it's like, but doesn't that like decrease your effectiveness in certain like lifting? And it's like, yeah, it actually does, you know, like, but I'm sacrificing function in one area to have function in another. Now let's look at an even harder example. Um, I've, tennis people are notorious for this, but talk to like tennis players who have like knee problems, which is so freaking common. Um, you know, all that lateral movement is hell on someone's knees, but it's the sport that they love, <laughs> right? So they are willing to like kind of make that sacrifice to sort of do that activity. Uh, look at like boxers, right? Same thing. There's a lot of time spent in like these very specific positions. Um, it makes you more effective at the sport. Is it overall functional? 
maybe not, you know, maybe you're pulling your body into like an alignment and that's why you got to focus on like all that chest flexibility, right? Boxers are constantly working on just drawing all of that back in the other direction because like this is defense, you know, um, horizontal adduction is, de is a defensive position, um, which means you need to do horizontal abduction if you want to be functional in the rest of your life. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's, that's an interesting kind of topic, uh, that, you know, is always kind of fun to talk about. Um, so in the end, the big thing we want to remember is that your muscle and your fascia, no matter what the soft tissue is, is going to respond to flexibility training by stretching your body out. You are going to hopefully model that stress and make a more flexible body. Um, there is also the neurological side of things rather than just the structural side of things, which leads to, you know, uh, the neurologic responses like stretch reflexes, which we use uh, during dynamic stretches or autogenic and reciprocal inhibition, which we use during like static stretches and active stretches uh, um, each, right? So that is kind of how we actually improve these things. Um, so let's take a look here at the actual program design aspect of it, right? So program design principles related to flexibility training. Okay, so uh, in level one, which is phases, phase one, right, you are going to perform what we call corrective flexibility, right? Uh, which is the type of flexibility designed to improve overactive and underactive muscles. This is going to consist of uh, SMR, self myofascial release, or SMR. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it's going to consist of static stretches. I'm also going to put PNF stretches up here, uh, which we have not put up in the past, in some parts of the past. So we're going to put up neuromuscular stretching, such as proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, aka PNF stretching. Um, you can just call it neuromuscular stretching or you can call it PNF. Nobody needs to say proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Um, but that is also an example of corrective flexibility. Um, however, it's performed very differently. Like SMR and static stretches are both held for about 30 seconds. PNF stretches are actually where uh, you are going to take something to a point of stretch and then have your client actively contract uh, the antagonist muscles similar to active stretching uh, in order to create uh, reciprocal inhibition. Um, and that's also for relatively long loads. So what you would do is you would have somebody stretch uh, for 20 to 30 seconds, then you would have them contract and then relax and stretch further. And then you have them contract and then relax and stretch further. And that will make them more and more flexible. Basically, PNF stretching is taking the advantages of um, static stretches, which uses autogenic inhibition, and it, it adds in a little bit of active stretches, which uses reciprocal inhibition. So you're getting both types of nervous system signals. Um, uh, actually, you know what? I do want to review those real quick. Are they, hold on, skipping forward again. Yeah, okay, and going back. Uh, I do want to include two more principles. I apologize if this is goofing up your notes, um, but I want to include autogenic inhibition. That's always a key vocabulary term, uh, but that is the physiologic uh, process by which the nervous system uh, inhibits a muscle spindle due to uh, stimulation of a Golgi tendon organ, right? So muscle spindles are sensory receptors located in the muscle res responsible 
for uh, sensing uh, length changes and rate of length changes of the muscle, right? So your muscle spindle tells your brain how long the muscle is. Uh, it often becomes overactive, um, so it will lie to the brain, so that it kind of protects the muscle. Again, it tries to keep it bunched up and say, no, we're at full length now. We couldn't possibly stretch any further. Uh, and then you got Golgi tendon organs, which are sensory receptors that are located in the tendons of muscles responsible for sensing changes in tension and rate of tension changes, right? So Golgi tendon organ sense how much tension there is. So if you push a Golgi tendon organ, it will stimulate both the Golgi tendon organ and the muscle spindle. So it'll go, whoa, there's lots of tension. Whoa, there's lots of uh, length. And so your nervous system is going to go, oh, God, I should contract that muscle and make it relax. That's why when you're foam rolling, you kind of squeeze your muscles when you first start. But then what happens is the Golgi tendon organ starts to realize there's actually very low tension. Um, and it's actually in a very safe position. So once it realizes that, sort of wakes the nervous system up and actually inhibits the muscle spindle and allows the muscle spindle to go, hey, if there's no tension, we're not at full length. Shut up. You know, it literally makes the muscle spindle relax. That process where we put pressure on one to inhibit the other is autogenic inhibition, okay? Um, so it is the physiologic process by which the nervous system inhibits a muscle spindle due to the stimulation of your Golgi tendon organs. Uh, and then again, I'm just gonna copy this from up above. We have uh, reciprocal inhibition, which is where when you contract an agonist, it will uh, relax the antagonist, right? Um, so it's a physiologic process by where an agonist contracts and the antagonist relaxes. So corrective flexibility, which consists of SMR and static stretches, uh, takes advantage of, these are both examples of autogenic inhibition. Uh, then, uh, and then we're gonna acute variables here, actually, I'm trying to remember how I did this. I got, I was gonna open up our previous classes notes. Desktop, remote Sochi, uh, PFT, we'll go to 109. Where's flexibility? Uh, core balance reactive, so it would be here. There we go. I just wanna make sure I get these notes right. Um, 109 notes. There we go. Haha. <laughs> this down here so I have a template template acquired uh, stable okay so it should have been stabilization level one which is phase one uh, colon it consists of corrective flexibility consists of SMR and static stretches there we go acute variables <laughs> and delete. <laughs> so you're gonna do one to two sets, uh, 30 second uh, holds for each rep. Uh, obviously that's not true for uh, neuromuscular stretching, right? Uh, neuromuscular stretching is very special. Um, that is actually where you are going to hold the contraction for about 20 seconds. Uh, then you are going to have your client contract for about five seconds. Uh, and then you will have them relax for another 20 seconds and you'll do multiple repetitions of that. So neuromuscular stretching is corrective, but it doesn't follow these specific acute variables. Uh, you will learn those acute variables with Mo uh, because neuromuscular stretching is very much a corrective um, exercise uh, technique. All right, strength level, which is level two which is phases two, three, and four. This is going to be active flexibility, which will consist of uh, self-myofascial release again, Oh my God, SMR. Uh, and it will also consist of active isolated stretches. 
Okay. Um, so that is your active flexibility. Um, again, this is going to take advantage of reciprocal inhibition instead of autogenic inhibition. And our acute variables are going to be uh, one to two sets of uh, five to 10 reps or one to two second holds each. Okay. Um, so that is going to be reciprocal inhibition, right? Neuromuscular, by the way, you can still do neuromuscular. In fact, I'll even put it down here because you can still do this here. But remember, PNF stretching is technically considered you know what? Actually, yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, it is considered, this is considered corrective flexibility. Um, but if you had a client in level two, you can still do PNF stretching. You can do PNF stretching with all clients, no matter where you're doing it. Um, it doesn't have the negative effects that static stretches have because it is taking advantage of reciprocal inhibition, which doesn't inhibit your muscle, leading to like that weakness um, that occurs, you know? Uh, we probably all heard somebody say, don't stretch before you work out. It makes you weaker. Um, that is only partly true. That is a misunderstanding. Um, ac uh, you know, static stretches have been shown to make you weaker for your upper 30% of strength. Uh, that is a much more accurate way to describe it. Um, active isolated stretches don't have that negative effect because they're using reciprocal inhibition, not autogenic. Autogenic inhibits your muscles. Reciprocal does not. Um, so you can do PNF stretching and still not have to worry about some of these muscles being turned off. And for the record, and this isn't a NASM stance thing, um, there is a ton of research to suggest that even if you do turn those muscles off pre-workout, um, if you do some dynamic stretches afterwards, it turns them right back on. That's not NASM's stance, but like there's a ton of research out there to indicate that like, yeah, if I did a bunch of static stretches before going and doing bench press day, if before I do the bench press, I do some arm swings, my muscles turn right back on, but it's at its new length. So anyway, that's, I don't want to teach that and I'm never going to put that in your notes because it's not an official like sports medicine stance, uh, but tons of people, tons of people have researched this. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's how, that's what's happening. Finally, we have functional flexibility in the power level. Level three, phase five, right? That is going to be functional flexibility, uh, which will consist of self myofascial release, or SMR, and uh, dynamic stretches. Okay, so dynamic stretches are usually like body weight exercises or um, uh, calisthenics or uh, ballistic stretches, uh, you know, arm circles and arm swings and scarecrows and things like that. Um, and so what you're going to do here is you're going to do one to two sets uh, eight to 10 reps. Uh, oops, those are acute variables. Uh, when you're performing those, right? Which that's not right. Uh, am I going crazy or is it 10? It's 10 to 15, right? They updated in the fourth edition to 10, 10 to 15. I am all turned around today. Um, Pretty sure I got that right. Uh, that's how many reps you're gonna actually do. Boy, I got so many different versions of NASA I'm running through my head at this point that it's all screwed up. <laughs> so um, here's the big thing we wanna remember. The technique with the greatest increase of flexibility is actually going to be da -da 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 -da, neuromuscular stretching. Love static stretches, I think they're great, but you know what's better than static stretches? Static stretches with a little bit of active stretches thrown in to the mix. So. Now, let's put the rules for how to do PNF stretching down here. So um, this is going to get its own little line here. But neuromuscular stretching. So this is what sometimes gets confusing for students who are studying this stuff. 
Um, uh, oh, God. Jay, your glasses line up with the light in your ceiling. And I thought you were wearing a pair of glasses that were like this big each. Like I thought the lenses were coming out to here. <laughs> it was lined up with your ceiling light. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I thought you like went to Party City or something. <laughs> um, and we're back and I am easily distracted. Uh, so <laughs> neuromuscular stretching. Here's, here's what you need to remember, guys. Um, neuromuscular stretching will fall under the corrective flexibility category. So if you get a question that says, which of the following is an example of corrective flexibility, and it has like a PNF stretch listed. Um, by the way, it'll never put static in there as it'll never have both of them. Um, but if it has like three active stretches and one PNF stretch, the PNF is considered corrective flexibility. Okay. Um, but technically it's its own category of thing. Um, technically it's its own stuff. So we're going to give it its own category here, but I want you to remember it is corrective flexibility. So neuromuscular stretching, uh, is going to be like PNF is an example, um, is going to be a cat, a type of stretch that takes advantage of both autogenic inhibition uh, through it eh, and reciprocal inhibition, right? Uh, it gets, gets the advantages of autogenic inhibition through its long durations, and it gets the advantages of reciprocal inhibition through its contractions. So um, what you're going to do for your acute variables, um, generally the, the simplest version of this is like one set where you do like a 30 second hold uh, and then you contract and then you do another 30 seconds. Um, that's pretty significant actually, and it results uh, in some changes. Um, but uh, that's not uh, NASM's approach to how to perform this. Uh, instead, uh, PNF stretching uh, acute variables. If you look at your acute variables uh, for the way NASM likes to do things, this is, that's so unhelpful. <laughs> um, oh, I just moved too quickly. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to do one to three repetitions, and then you have a contracting and relaxing that's going to be applied. So you're going to contract for about seven to 15 seconds. You're going to stretch for about 20 to 30 seconds. And you're only contracting, by the way, like, uh, 20 to 25 percent. You're not like trying to force the other person into the ground. You're not contracting super hard. Um, but here's an example because uh, you can do a little bit of PNF by yourself. It generally helps to have a trainer. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my hand here and I'm going to do a pectoral wall stretch. So I'm going to stretch and I'm going to hold that stretch for 20 to 30 seconds. So let's say I hold that 20 seconds. Do, 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 20 seconds is up. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna contract for seven seconds. So I'm gonna isometrically squeeze my pec. I'm gonna isometrically contract my entire upper body here. And I'm gonna squeeze, I'm gonna squeeze, I'm gonna squeeze, and then I'm gonna relax. And I'm gonna stretch a little bit further. I'm gonna hold that new range of motion for 20 to 30 seconds. And I can do multiple rounds of that. Um, and basically, like I said, I'm getting the benefit of both. Um, so uh, one to three repetitions of that means uh, you do your initial stretch, contract, that's your first, re and then stretch again, that's your first repetition. Then you contract, stretch again, that's your second, contract, stretch again, that's your, your third repetition. So technically, it says one to three repetitions here, but technically you hold the stretches four times and you do the contractions one to three times. Well, 
you do the stretches like technically two to four times and you do the contractions one to three times. Um, but that's not how they write it on the test. They're going to write it one to three reps. Um, because that initial like stretching isn't really a rep. It, it kind of is like the pre, the preemptive like part of it. Um, so your acute variables are one to three sets. Um, and then what you're going to do, uh, what you, I'm sorry, one to three reps. What you're going to do is you're going to contract seven to 15. I like 10. I think 10 is perfect. And I personally like 20 um, because then it makes it a nice even 30 seconds. And I know like my clients can get used to that. Uh, and then my intensity again is like 20 to 25% max effort. You're not really squeezing all that hard. Um, so one to three uh, reps actually. Um, stretch for 20 to 30 seconds. Um, you're going to contract for seven to 15 seconds. Uh, and then intensity of contraction is going to be about 20 to 25%. So nothing hard. You're not really squeezing all that hard. Um, and that is how you perform PNF stretches. Um, again, you're going to get to practice this in capstone. Um, but we'll also talk about practicing it sometimes in the core uh, when we pair up and do specific activities. So um, here's NASM's position, by the way. Uh, you guys have heard me say that like stretching makes you weaker. Um, here's NASM's stance on that. So uh, isolated muscles uh, may not cause like limited range of motion. Um, a lot of times, uh, well, first we got to understand that like Flex, pro, improper flexibility in one muscle will often affect your other one. So isolated muscles don't necessarily just reduce your range of motion. It's how isolated muscles affect each other that reduces your range of motion. Um, so proper flexibility is required in a strength training program so that you have proper extensibility throughout the entire kinetic chain. Um, but do you need to static stretch every muscle in the body? No, of course not. You need to static stretch over active muscles. Now, sending a little blood flow to your entire body before you start working out is always going to be a good idea. So let's say I've got an overactive chest, right? I want to do static stretches to turn all of these muscles off. But let's say, like, what about my upper back? My, my upper back is underactive. Do I need to do uh, stretches for my upper back? And it's like, the immediate answer might be, no, of course not. You don't want to turn the muscles in your upper back off. Those are the weak muscles, right? Um, well, remember, I still want to get blood to those muscles. I want to deliver some nutrients and some oxygen, and I want to increase their temperature so that they're nice and elastic because Lord knows I don't want to pull any muscle in any part of my body because it's not prepared to do a bunch of maximum strength lifting. So doing a little bit of like foam rolling in my thoracic spine or you know, something as simple as like a cat cow stretch or even just like a shoulder stretch there. Um, that's not necessarily going to be a bad thing for me. I just shouldn't be applying corrective flexibility like these big long static stretches to muscles that are already underactive. That's why like I really do not like this stretch. This is such a common stretch that you see people do in the gym all the time. And like I was taught this in PE uh, and it's a stretch for my posterior deltoid, which is an often underactive muscle. That's not something I want to decrease its activity in. If anything, I want to increase its activity, right? Um, so, but it's not that I don't want to get blood flow there in general. So instead, why don't I do something like an arm swing, which, you know, warms the area up without decreasing its activity. And that's why we like functional flexibility so much. Um, so, uh, determine which muscles need to be lengthened, right? That's what NASM wants you to do. They want you to base it on the assessment. What muscles are overactive? Those are the ones you need to do corrective flexibility on. Um, during your warm up, use static stretches on overactive muscles. Now, let's say you have a client in the power phase, uh, but they still have a really bad anterior pelvic tilt. You know, in general, in the power phase, we should be doing dynamic stretches, not static ones. But if they have an anterior tilt, I'm going to turn their hip flexors off with static stretches, power level or not, because what's important to me is posture, not like their overall power, you know? I mean, the power is important. That's the goal of training, but I don't want to, 
have power at the expense of like proper form. So I would still do static stretches no matter what phase of training my client is in if they have specific overactive muscles. So during the warm up, only use static stretches on overactive muscles, not on everything. Uh, and then during the cool down, you can use static stretches everywhere. <laughs> you know, like you can do whatever. The, the workout's over. Although again, you should really only do it to muscles that need to return to normal length. Um, so warming up, stretch out your overactive stuff. Cooling down, stretch out your overactive stuff and anything that you might have shortened during that workout. Um, and then if they are trained, you can use neuromuscular stretching, uh, I'm sorry, not if they're trained, if you are trained, if you know how to do PNF stretching, you can do PNF stretching, which everybody here is definitely going to know how to do because that's Mo's job. <laughs> um, so don't use static stretches before intense activity. Static stretches will result in inactivity of those muscles. Um, that, may, uh, that may result in a decreased strength in that muscle, right? We are gonna turn those muscles off before trying to lift heavy doesn't make any sense. Um, so only do it if a muscle imbalance exists. Occasionally, there will be the rare instance where doing a static stretch draws you into proper posture and actually increases your strength. Uh, but that's not happening from a nervous system standpoint. That's just happening from like a proper posture standpoint. Um, generally, the viewpoint is if your client's going to be lifting heavy, you should be doing active or dynamic stretches, not static ones. Um, static stretching, yeah, negatively induce, uh, influences your strength, uh, and it may last up to two hours. And then I love that this is in here. There is considerable debate though. It's saying it's a seven to 8% reduction. I've actually seen the reduction be higher than that. Um, but I mean, seven to 8% is just not that much, you know, and it's only affecting, uh, your 70% or higher one rep max. Um, you know, it only affects your repetitions up to about 12. If you're doing 13 reps, it has like zero effect. Um, so it's like, you know, are static stretches really the end of the, at the end of the day all that bad? Not really. Um, but at the same time, if you're training athletes, that 7 to 8% actually could mean all the difference. That could be in the difference between winning and losing. So we get it. We, we understand why we're bringing it up. Um, but again, it's not... Uh, just your overall strength. Your overall strength doesn't decrease. It's, it's when your static stretch is used properly in combination with these other things, it may not have an effect. Uh, but they don't take a really hard stance on that. Like I said, some people have been doing more research on this and they found that dynamic stretches turn it right back on. Uh, but NASM doesn't have like a super strong stance on that. Uh, but anyway, uh, static stretches, it could decrease your power. You know, it could reduce your strength. So you lose jump height, you lose balance, you lose reaction time. That's why you don't see a lot of like pro athletes doing super long duration stretches. They're often doing like in motion stretches um, because they need to jump as high as they can before the game starts. Um, uh, and then, yeah, research has shown that, uh, you know, obviously self myofascial release, static stretches, active stretches and dynamic stretches, all of them at the end of the day, this is like them, this is where Nassim and I speak similarly. At the end of the day, <laughs> stretching will improve your imbalances, it will decrease your risk of injury, and overall that will result in increased performance. The, there is no debate there. Flexibility, proper range of motion, those are good things. So um, that is about it, guys. I got nothing else for you. Uh, how's everybody feeling today? Pretty good? I think that was our long, I think that's going to be our longest lecture of this course, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I remember uh, in class, this is a particularly long day whenever I teach it. And I'm trying to remember if there's another, I mean, obviously big chart day always gets a little long. Um, India, it's your birthday today. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday, India. Happy birthday. Thank Bye. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you can do something off for the weekend. What was that? Gemini gang. Gemini gang, yep. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Well, I hope you get to do something cool this weekend. Um, do something fun. The world's opening up, so, you know. Yeah, just make I sure heard. you stay away from any coppers. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, Sam's over cooking breakfast this morning. That's awesome. Well, heck, have a good birthday weekend, and uh, yeah, we'll see everybody on Monday, okay? All right, Brad. Thank you. All right, see you later, guys. Good job today. You too, Bye.